Okay, thank you uh, everyone for attending, um, everyone here in person and everyone on the uh, web uh, for what is our last of our New South Wales government uh, webinar series for 2017. Um, we've had two great sessions already. Our first one was alternative ways to resolve disputes with guest speaker Stephen Lankin. And secondly, we did a webinar on managing ill and injured workers and navigating the maze of obligations that we need to navigate as employers. Today we conclude our webinar series by looking at some odds and ends that pop up from time to time in employment disciplinary processes and investigations. Now of course if you want to um, watch our past seminars or today's seminar, uh, simply register, visit our website for details from our insights page that will then take you to the webcast page where you can sign up and then launch the webinars. I understand those webinars are going to be available at least until the end of the year. So enough from me. Um, let me hand over to Amber Sharp to introduce you to our topic today and to get the ball rolling. I feel like I'm wearing a Madonna headset. Thank you, James, and welcome, everybody. So the topic today, odds and ends, twists and turns, some laws to know. It's obviously a common scenario. There is some misconduct. It may be criminal, corrupt, or maladministration. The misconduct may be unprofessional or unsatisfactory professional conduct. It may be unsafe or in breach of a duty. But there is often a toxic workplace culture and a culture of silence, which means that people don't want to talk. Okay, moving right along. There are obviously a myriad of legal obligations which can impact on how a disciplinary investigation is conducted. It's more than just straight up employment laws. Um, technology is providing employers with greater access to useful and revealing information, but are you allowed to use it? Managing any investigation, disciplinary and HR process, um, these are the odds and ends that you all need to know. In terms of what we'll cover today, we're going to look at criminal records um, and the vexed question of criminal record discrimination. We're going to look at secret recordings. Can you use them? Um, what about obligations to report conduct or performance issues? What are those reporting obligations? We'll look at the issue of responding to criminal investigation and charges and other uh, regulatory processes. Is an employer obliged to suspend a disciplinary investigation if there are parallel criminal proceedings on foot? And finally, uh, we'll look at GIPA and maintaining confidentiality. Uh, now, just to keep things fresh, James and I are going to be doing a bit of a tag team here to keep everybody awake. Um, I'll be pressing on in the first part and then we'll throw over to James. Um, but where we're going to start in terms of a bit of context for the topics we will cover is a New South Wales government webinar story. Now, if you would like, you can kick back and relax and I will just read it to you. If you are somebody who would prefer to follow along at home, it's actually in your pack. So here it is. Here's the scenario. Uh, there's an employee who sometime after the relevant events approaches a manager to confidentially report a nurse who, allegedly, regularly laughs at and mocks patients with another colleague and on one occasion struck an elderly patient and bruised the patient. The employee produces a secret recording of the nurse laughing and mocking the patients. After some preliminary investigations, information is provided to the agency that this nurse has engaged in inappropriate behaviour at work in the past, including bullying behaviour. This nurse allegedly has passed domestic violence and assault offences. Um, but finally, nobody will actually speak up against the nurse for fear of retaliation. The agency investigates. As part of the process, the agency puts the two allegations to the nurse, 
without showing her the secret recordings. The nurse denies the allegations and refuses to talk because the patient's family has made a complaint to the police. The agency nevertheless finds the allegations substantiated. The nurse makes an application under the Government Information Public Access Act 2009 for all witness statements and the agency's investigation report. The director is asked to consider dismissal. So this is where we come in. Applying a critical mind and leaving aside matters of procedural fairness, the director asked for advice on the following issues. Number one. Did we do a criminal record check on the nurse before we employed them? Number two, can we use the secret recording? Was the employee allowed to secretly record the nurse's private conversation? How can I ignore what the nurse said? Three, has the organisation reported this matter to the police and to the nursing board? Number four, do we need to stop this process and wait for any police criminal regulatory process? Number five, can the nurse get access to the witness statements and report? Intrigued? Let's press on. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is just talk about the issues that that particular scenario throws up as opposed to chapter and verse in response to this scenario. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was criminal record discrimination. Um, you may or may not be aware that um, criminal record is a ground of discrimination under the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. If you've ever gone looking for the provision, it's actually really tricky to find uh, because it appears in the regulations um, uh, as, a, as a definition of discrimination, but it is in there. Um, now, the way it works is that uh, excluding somebody on the basis of criminal record will be discrimination unless you can demonstrate that the criminal record uh, is relevant to the person's ability to perform the inherent requirements of the particular job. But what's quite interesting about this regime is that it operates in a very different way to the individual complaints-based process that we're familiar with. What I mean by that is this. In the ordinary course, somebody alleges that they've been subject to unlawful discrimination. Uh, let's take the federal jurisdiction by way of example. They run off to the Australian Human Rights Commission, seek to conciliate the complaint, uh, and if it doesn't resolve, they can elect to take the matter to the federal court or the federal circuit court uh, to commence proceedings and then to seek damages or compensation. It's a very different regime in relation to criminal records. How it actually works is that the matter stops at the Australian Human Rights Commission. So in the first instance, have a bit of a chin wag, see if you can resolve it um, uh, by conciliation. But if that fails, the Australian Human Rights Commission can conduct their own investigation, but it can't actually make any binding findings. It can only make recommendations. And what it can also do is actually table a report in Parliament. So the main sting in the tail of this particular jurisdiction can be reputational damage. Okay, so I'm going to uh, review two quick decisions which are relevant to the way the particular provisions operate. Um, so the first was Mr CG and Railcorp. Um, this was a situation where an employee applied for a market analyst position in 2009, was shortlisted as a preferred candidate, but he had convictions for middle range driving offences and low range driving uh, offence, which predated uh, the particular application. Rao Corp elected not to offer him employment and the Australian Human Rights Commission found it was discrimination. Now, they found that it was discrimination on the basis that these particular offences had no impact on his ability to perform the inherent requirements of the job. So as a consequence, the Australian Human Rights Commission made a recommendation. They recommended that Rao Corp make a payment of $7,500, and they also recommended that uh, Rao Corp review its recruitment policies. 
Railcorp didn't necessarily agree with the recommendation and it actually declined to pay any compensation, but it did agree to review its policies. So this case essentially illustrates that criminal record conviction is a ground of discrimination. The inherent requirements defence is relevant to whether there has been unlawful conduct, but ultimately, in terms of consequence, a binding decision cannot be made impacting on the employer, but it remains the case that recommendations can be made and a report can be published in Parliament. A slightly, oh sorry sir, can I just wait one second? We've got a roving mic because we've got people who are joining us on the webinar. I just wanted to ask uh, how uh, the Act applies the test of inherent requirements against criminal record. Uh, I understand how it works in relation to disability. Uh, Certainly. It's a very good record. question. It's a I'm very sure. good question. Um, the, the base example that I, well, well I guess the starting position is, um, as is ordinarily the case with legislation, it provides us with very little guidance. Um, but the base example that I often give is that if you have somebody who has applied for a position, for example, as a Chief Financial Officer, and they have a criminal record related to um, fraud, there would be a sound basis for the employer to say, not so happy about bringing you on board to perform that role, given you've got a history of um, snatching other people's money. The Rao Corp example though, was that somebody was being brought in to perform a market analyst position and being held against them was their driving record which could have no possible relevance to their ability to perform the role. Um, perhaps a less stark example may be that you have, um, say you've got a salesperson who uh, drives around procuring sales. In that particular circumstance, if somebody is required to use a vehicle as part of their employment and they have uh, convictions for drink driving or driving offences, that may be more relevant to uh, their ability. Why don't we talk about our nurse? So you'll recall from our story earlier today, um, there was a question about whether um, the particular nurse had offences for domestic violence offences. So on the one hand, you may think, well, this is a person who is going to have within her charge the safety of our patients. So if she has been uh, convicted for violent offences, this may be relevant to her ability to perform the inherent requirements of the role in terms of us discharging our functions, providing safe hospitals. But I guess the complicating factor is, what were the circumstances of those convictions? Was this, I don't know, a battered wife who ultimately um, hit back? So you sort of need to be looking at what the circumstances are. But does that give you a sense of the issues that arise? I was just going to touch on one other case, which is uh, Gentleman and Lynn Fox. This is quite a recent decision. And this was a situation where there was a labour hire worker who had applied for direct employment. So the context is this person has been working for this organisation, but not employed, and then they're seeking direct employment. A record check revealed possession of cannabis and deal property suspected proceeds of crime offences. Ultimately, Lynn Fox did not offer the employee employment. They said on the basis that the person failed to disclose those particular offences. Uh, and Lynn Fox said, look, the reason that this person failed to meet the inherent requirements of the role as far as we're concerned is that trust, honesty and integrity are instrumental to this role. So that was enough for us to decide. Uh, it was actually President Triggs who heard this particular matter or um, undertook the inquiry and uh, she formed quite a different view and she believed that this was criminal conviction discrimination. Uh, she recommended compensation for loss of earnings, hurt and humiliation uh, and compensation in the range of $2,000 and Lynn Fox said no, no we will not be doing that. Uh, but it remains that there is uh, published in Parliament a decision which said that Lynn Fox discriminated against this person on the basis of criminal record. Yes, sir. Amber, why, um, <clears throat> why would Lynn Fox be 
obliged to inform gentlemen of the reasons why he didn't get the job. I don't know that they were necessarily obliged to inform him, but certainly in the case he did become aware and it was on the basis of that knowledge that he pursued the claim. You're quite right though. I mean, as a, as a general rule, there's no absolute obligation on an employer to give somebody reasons. Uh, but it, I mean, maybe they just said, hey mate, we're not employing you because. The final thing I was just going to mention in relation to criminal records, and it also feeds into this issue about disclosure and whether it's a lack of integrity to fail to do so. There is a thing called a spent conviction. Um, and a spent conviction is a crime-free period of 10 years or three years if the conviction was under a children's court order. And a person is not obliged to disclose a spent conviction. So in this particular circumstance, if Lynn Fit Fox was seeking to assert uh, failure to disclose when there was a different offence, this spent conviction issue could have been relevant. Um, a conviction can never be spent if it relates to a conviction for a sexual offence or where there was a prison sentence of more than six months. I'm about to throw to James to talk about secret recording, so any further questions on that element? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I recall a case we did hear about uh, 10 years ago, and it involved a 62-year-old uh, garbage collector who was caught out by a citizen collecting the um, rubbish at McDonald's from their private bin. He would tip the private bin out, drive, his, well, drive the council truck around, collect the rubbish, go back around, collect it again, and then walk into McDonald's and get a coffee. And a citizen had filmed it and we thought, we have hit the jackpot here, we've got great evidence of this uh, garbage truck driver um, doing the wrong thing, using council property for an ulterior purpose or for a benefit. Now, we jump forward 10 years to today, and in almost any disciplinary matter, there's going to be a recording. And in fact, the first question that is probably asked is, do we have a recording of the incident? Do we have footage? Um, whereas 10 years ago, that, that wasn't the approach. Technology today means that workers, that customers, that ordinary citizens are recording everyday ordinary events of our employees. Um, so are CCTV cameras, so are the cameras in ATMs and a whole lot of other wonderful devices that are around. And this technology is collecting a whole lot of information, whether it's useful or not but it's collecting a whole lot of information in respect of employees' activities. But as employers, we've got to be aware that um, the collection of that information and that data, it's not a free-for-all, and there can be some important limitations that we need to be aware of. Now, legislation does vary from state to state, but in New South Wales, the main piece of legislation that I want to talk about is the Surveillance Devices Act 2007. Now that legislation covers not only recording devices, but it also records uh, optical and data surveillance devices and tracking devices. So it does cover a range of devices that are in use today, or that come as a, uh, a feature of many of the technological devices we use today. Um, but I'm gonna focus on listening devices. I'm also not gonna talk about the Workplace Surveillance Act, 2005, but it's important to keep in mind that that does govern surveillance at work. It governs the surveillance of computer and internet and email use. And that as organisations, you've got to have the right policies, you've got to be training your staff, and you have need to have obtained their consent to uh, be surveilling their email, internet and computer use. Um, and if you don't comply with that, well then the information you gather can't be used as evidence in any proceedings. So, so that's quite important. So let's look at secret recordings. Let's look at the Surveillance Devices Act. Uh, because in the example um, Amber read out, a nurse had recorded two nurses, and this is a real case, you, you can look it up, but it recorded two nurses uh, mocking patients. 
and, 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 and saying things that, as an employer, you would not expect them to, to be communicating. So the Surveillance Devices Act, it applies to a listening device. Now a listening device is any device capable of being used to record. So that's our phones. Our phones are listening devices because they're capable of recording a conversation. So are our cameras these days. The cameras record sound when put in movie mode. So these are all listening devices. Now there are two elements um, in the, or, or there are two relevant offences I'm going to talk about. The first is section seven, which is that a person must not knowingly use or cause to be used a listening device to record or listen to a private conversation of which they're not a party, or to record a private conversation to which they are a party. Now, you can record public conversations and events. What you can't record is a private conversation. Now, it might be quite hard in some cases to see where that divide is, but it's an objective assessment and basically a private conversation means any words that are spoken by one person to another in circumstances where it's reasonably taken to indicate that those persons don't want their words to be listened to anyone but those involved in the conversation. So you may be in a um, public room, but if I've turned my back to talk to someone, I don't intend for any of you to hear that, let alone record it. So if you were to come up behind and just hit record, you would be recording a private conversation. Um, now, it doesn't include a conversation where in the circumstances it should be reasonably expected that the conversation would be overheard. So if I walk up in the middle of everyone and turn around to have a conversation and have it loudly, I might be struggling to argue that that was a private conversation. But we can assume that the two nurses in our scenario were uh, talking to each other at work and having a private conversation not meant to be heard by anyone else other than themselves. Now, another aspect that's interesting in New South Wales and isn't in some other states and territories is the requirement that you must not knowingly use a listening device. Now, I'll admit, I don't know how to use the listening device on my phone, so if it does record, it's not done knowingly, and I can use whatever gold pops up on that. Um, because this is an important aspect of it, and, and it comes from the uh, intention of the legislation, which I'll talk about a, a little bit later. The second relevant offence is one you can't knowingly record a private conversation, but then you can't publish or communicate to any person a private conversation where that recording is obtained in contravention of that section I've just spoken about. So there's restrictions then on its use and its dissemination amongst uh, others in the business. Um, these are offence provisions. And, and, and I think they, they, they are significant and they do show Parliament's um, dislike for the use of listening devices and the community's dislike for the use of listening devices. Now, there are exceptions and it's important that we talk about these exceptions because whenever there's a secret recording, everyone runs off to these exceptions. And they don't impress me too much, I must say. Um, firstly, of course, if there's consent, um, express or implied, then the recording's okay. So if someone was, for example, to uh, put the phone on the meeting table and hit record in front of everyone and no one complains, there's probably implied consent. Um, then there's the exception that everyone goes to. Everyone runs to this. Oh, it was reasonably necessary for me to hit record and hide the phone inside my jacket or inside my bag because I had to protect the lawful interests of myself to the conversation. Um, now, uh, the secret recording needs to be not only reasonable, but necessary and always lawful. Now, whilst many things will be lawful, fewer are going to be necessary 
and fewer still are going to be reasonably necessary. Um, why, for example, in a discussion with your employer or your manager, can't you make notes of the conversation? Why do you need to secretly record it? Um, why can't you make a diary entry afterwards? Why can't you bring a support person in who makes notes of that meeting? It just doesn't appear obvious why it would be reasonably necessary to secretly record many conversations. And if there's any doubt about that view, and, and certainly employee lawyers will argue the other way, um, and I'm involved in that debate at present, um, you look at the other exemptions and you read the legislation as a whole and you see what it's talking about is that the communication or the publication is uh, reasonably necessary in connection with an imminent threat of serious violence or substantial property damage or a serious narcotic offence. It's talking about a type of conduct that perhaps necessitates the need for a secret recording to protect the lawful interest, not just recording any conversation in employment. So I think it's almost impossible to understand why any employee would need to secretly record other employees, even if what they are saying is abhorrent. Um, so if you, um, however, do have this secret recording and the nurses are saying absolutely terrible things that really give you concern about their fitness to work, do you, do you have to just ignore the secret recording? Do you ignore the information altogether? What do you do as the person investigating or as the uh, employer in this situation? Well, sign of the times, we had this case uh, last year, late last year, where this is Western Australia, so they didn't have the knowing aspect in terms of recording in their legislation. And what had happened, uh, a camera was on the uh, security officers, and those cameras get activated when there's an incident or they're able to activate it. In any event, it was accidentally activated by the security guard who walked up to a very colourful, uh, derogatory, racist conversation that was occurring between two employees. Um, and that was recorded when the security officer went back and downloaded it said, oh, look what I've got here. And then reported that up the line. And then that was going to be used, that recording, for disciplinary purposes. And the employee, uh, Mr Chappell, ran off to the federal court to get an injunction to not use that recording. And the court said, well, look, we think it is in contravention of the legislation, so you can't use it. Now, in the judge, the judge had read, listened and viewed the footage many, many times, to work out whether it was a private conversation or not. And I think viewing it so many times, the, the, the import of what was being recorded uh, weighed upon the judge. And the judge said right at the end, a little perler of a paragraph, but employer, even though I'm issuing the junction, it doesn't mean you can't go and get a statement from the security officer who recorded it, and had probably watched it over and over again so it's fresh in their memory. Get that statement in writing and go ahead. Follow your disciplinary process. Now, that's where I think perhaps the, the balance might lie in the sense of you can't ignore that information. You need to take action in respect of it. And we just go back to the, the old-fashioned way of gathering evidence. And it's not really that old-fashioned. It's just ask them what they see and, and, and what they recall. Um, now, we, we cannot forget, and I think this is important, and this is part of the uh, intention of these provisions, and, and these are some great uh, employment-related cases which basically illustrate that if employees are secretly recording, in particular, conversations with their employer, it's likely to represent a destruction of the necessary trust and confidence in the employment relationship. And that's going to be particularly the case where, for example, there is a uh, discussion about performance and the employee is acting up in that meeting and being very challenging. The fact that they've got the secret recording, they're probably goading the employer into acting in a way that's inappropriate or saying things that they shouldn't say. 
And, and the use of the secret recording really shows that the relationship is no longer viable. And these are the very clear messages that are coming out of uh, the uh, Supreme Court, out of the Federal Commission in saying, it's just not appropriate. It's not appropriate, even in this day and age, with all the technology, to be secretly recording conversations. Now, in the case of the employee who recorded the nurses talking, it, it might not result in dismissal, because I dare say they were recording because they were concerned about the gravity of what was being said, but you would need to issue a caution that you shouldn't really be secretly recording in the workplace. And, and that these matters can be dealt with in other ways. Now, in any investigation, I think it's always important that we are aware and we never forget, and, 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 and this can happen easily and often, of the need to report any behaviour or misconduct. Um, an obvious example is the obligation to report <coughs> criminal conduct. And that's set out in section 316 of the Crimes Act, where if a person has committed a serious indictable offence, now you don't need to know whether they have or they haven't. It's just a matter of fact, if they have committed it, and you know or believe that the offence has been committed, and you've got information which is of material assistance uh, in securing the apprehension or conviction, then unless you've got a reasonable excuse, you need to report it to police. Now a serious indictable offence is um, an offence punishable five years or more imprisonment and can I tell you a lot of conduct falls within that category. Um, many many years ago I had a client call me up and say James um, someone has circulated by email a video footage which I'm concerned about and it, this was back in the, the days where we were sending video clips by way of email and um, employer policies weren't up to speed with um, regulating appropriate uh, circulation of material. But this video clip was, and I had the unfortunate uh, experience of having to look at it quickly, but it was a live recording of someone being eaten alive. It was a live recording of someone who had volunteered in response to an ad um, in Germany to be eaten alive. And the employee that forwarded it within the workplace said, look at this, this looks so real. And it was real. They, they didn't realise that it was real, but they've forwarded it on, and it's an offence to forward material that can't be classified. And, and the police were left in the position where they had to charge this employee with circulating material that couldn't be classified. So there can be a lot of things that can happen that may be an offence and, and, and one needs to be at least asking the question. Um, through to the um, uh, New South Wales Law Reform Commission in talking about this particular section said stealing a chocolate bar is an offence uh, punishable by more than five years. So, so you need to be careful of the obligation to report you also need to be aware of the obligation to report elsewhere. It's not just criminal conduct. It may be uh, conduct that is corrupt under the Independent uh, Commission Against Corruption Act. It may be under other legislation, such as where an ombudsman or another authority has oversight. Um, there is nothing worse than failing to report and then later being criticised for it. Um, the obligation to report might also kick in at different times that once you start gathering some more information, you then actually form the belief that someone has committed the offence and now I need to report. And then you can certainly document doing that. Um, one of the, the, the things that I recommend everyone does, and, and it's a good step to do in, in your practice, is make good contact with the local commander at the police force, make good contact with anyone in the ICAC or the Ombudsman to be able to discuss issues as they arise and address them when they arise to be able to have that discussion and seek guidance. So that then naturally brings us up to the next topic.
Thank you indeed. Okay, I'd like a quick show of hands. Who ordinarily takes the view that if there are pending criminal allegations, that a disciplinary investigation should be suspended? Show of hands. All right. No, I disagree. Um, okay, this issue actually arose for me uh, uh, earlier this year uh, with a client who said, uh, look, we've got a situation. There's a particular employee who is being investigated in relation to misconduct. There was an episode that happened at uh, staff drinks where a woman got um, extremely intoxicated and then was allegedly sexually assaulted by one of her colleagues when she was in the bathroom at this particular venue. And it was being investigated as a disciplinary issue in relation to whether that employee should be terminated for their conduct. But during the investigation, it also became clear that the alleged victim had reported it to the police. So there was a criminal investigation pending. And I was contacted by this particular client because she said, oh look, our workplace conduct unit has decided that they're not going to take any further action in relation to this matter at this stage and they're just going to wait and see. But I'm concerned because the criminal matter keeps getting stood over, stood over and stood over and this particular person is currently uh, stood down on full pay. Um, she said, I'd, I've raised this issue with my panel solicitors in the past and I keep getting conflicting advice about what we need to do. Can you have a proper look at this? What should we do in this circumstance? Very helpfully, there was a case that was almost immediately on point. And here it is. Um, so this was a situation where uh, a disciplinary process had been commenced in circumstances where a uh, senior manager and mentor had taken a junior employee um, out for a mentoring lunch. Uh, they had both apparently got quite inebriated and then he took her back to a hotel and she alleges sexually assaulted her. Um, it was a circumstance where, this wasn't an unfair dismissal claim, this was a circumstance where the uh, relevant AWA had a provision in there which said that uh, if there were going to be disciplinary matters, the person should be given uh, notice of the allegations and an opportunity to respond. Combank conducted their investigation and they then approached the particular employee and invited that employee to respond to the allegations. And the particular employee said that on legal advice, given the pending uh, criminal charges, uh, he was going to decline to answer any of those questions. And during the interview, with each question that he was asked, he said, I decline to answer, I decline to answer, I decline to answer. And ultimately, what the bank did was made a decision on the basis of the information that was available to them, that on the balance of probabilities, that conduct had actually occurred. Now, the particular employee said that during the process, he had been denied procedural fairness because the circumstances dictated that he could not properly respond to the allegations, of course, invoking the right to silence. Uh, but that was flat out rejected by the court. And what the court said was that there was nothing to prevent the bank from continuing with its investigation, including termination, whilst the matter remained in the hands of the New South Wales Police. Um, now, it was interesting looking into this matter though, because there are quite a lot of decisions on this particular issue, but there are fewer decisions that are straight up in the context of an unfair dismissal claim. Um, and the reason I'm floating that issue is because it does become relevant as to whether somebody has been given a proper opportunity to respond. And so there is this tension between somebody saying, um, well, I can't properly respond because I'm entitled to invoke my right to silence. Um, but as I say, this particular case operates as a very good guide, even though it's not in the unfair dismissal jurisdiction, that that particular argument is less likely to gain weight. I'm going to mention a different decision though, which raised similar issues, but in a bit of a different context. And this is a very well known decision, which is uh, Murray Irrigation and Balsden. And what this particular decision related to was a circumstance where an employee 
had allegedly engaged in fraudulent dealings and an investigation was commenced. The employee was invited to provide a response and the employee declined to do so, um, again invoking his right to silence because of pending criminal charges. And then the employee did something at that stage, which was actually to direct the employee to answer those questions. So what the employer said was, well, you are not voluntarily participating, but now we are going to make a lawful and reasonable direction that you respond to our inquiries. The employee again refused to do so, and in the event the employee was terminated, not because of the alleged fraudulent dealings, but because of the failure to comply with the lawful and reasonable direction. Now you'll see there that I say the termination was harsh, unjust or unreasonable. Now again, this was not in the context of an unfair dismissal case, but that was actually the expression that was used in the enterprise agreement. So there was a discussion around this issue of whether the employee could be lawfully directed to respond to questions in the face of the employee's right to silence. And ultimately, in that particular decision, um, the Court of Appeal found that the trial judge was correct in that that requirement against that backdrop um, did result in harsh, unjust or unreasonable termination. Yes, sir. Can we just have the roving mic, please? Thank you, Anna. Did you say that this wasn't an unfair dismissal It case? wasn't an unfair dismissal, but the expression harsh, unjust or unreasonable was, was dealt with in that so enterprise agreement. So it's more of a, uh, a dispute over the terms of the... That's right. right. That's right, exactly. Okay. I'm just going to mention one other case quickly, uh, which is this issue around whether um, there is any automatic right to stay civil proceedings pending criminal charges being determined. And the answer to that has consistently been no. So again, um, to the extent that somebody suggests that civil proceedings cannot proceed in the face of criminal proceedings in the background, the court has been unwilling to grant an injunction in those circumstances. Ultimately, where we get to is that there are tips and traps to be aware of if you're going to go down the path of continuing an investigation when there are criminal proceedings on foot. Um, first up, I think the Murray Irrigation decision is instructive that <clears throat> An attempted lawful and reasonable direction to answer questions may cause you more harm than good. Ultimately, in those circumstances, an employer, let's assume that you end up in unfair dismissal land, an employer will still need to satisfy the commission on the balance of probabilities that the alleged conduct occurred. So for that reason, it's just very important to be across the reason that you're making the decision. Do make the decision on the information that is available. Do not make an adverse inference from a failure to answer questions. And in the matter that I had been dealing with, that was the sort of slippery slope that they were heading in. Well, we have this version of events. He's not giving his version of events. Therefore, we should necessarily prefer her version of events that is not a safe finding. Um, so don't make an adverse inference from a failure to answer questions um, and do not ground a decision on an absence of the employee to provide a satisfactory explanation. Before I throw over to James though, when we started that there were a few people who had a different view. Did anybody want to raise any comments or questions around that issue? Yes sir. Can we have the roving mic? Lovely, thank you, Anna. Hi. Um, yeah, look, I don't necessarily disagree with anything that you've said. I think it, in some respects we have practical considerations Absolutely. that we need to I take into account. That. Like uh, we have relationships with police as a stakeholder 
And often the ombudsman um, gives us directions not to undertake an investigation absolutely. until we have direction from them. So that's just all the clarification look, I wanted to make. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it's also the case um, that if there is a pending criminal investigation, it can be easier to rely on the findings or the evidence that flows from that process sometimes in deciding the disciplinary matter. Obviously different burdens of proof and it's not necessarily going to be determinative. Um, I guess the issue that created a bit of a hook in our particular matter was this person was actually stood down on full pay. So the consequence for the organisation of actually just having to put everything on hold was quite significant. But no, I think that's a really good point. Okay, James, over to you. Thank you. I was going to say in that last um, practical uh, uh, outcome that, that you raised, um, I've uh, uh, been involved with a client who was um, investigating the uh, taking and selling of drugs at work and when brought to the attention you could see that there was a, a culture that the employer needed to break down straight away and, and what we did is we went to the commander at the local police station and said this is what we've got we, we are going to do a random search of everyone's lockers in a few days. Do you want to be there with us? Or do you want us to just report? But we need to get it in bust. And will that inhibit anything you need to do? Do you have any intelligence on our workers that you want to say to us, hold off? Because we can't hold off forever. And, and we were able to work with the police to, to, to where they said, look, you go ahead, do what you've got to do, and then come back and tell us what you've, you've done and then we can take it from there. But, but we were very clear that we had an objective we needed to achieve first and foremost for the safety of everyone. Um, so I, th I think when you build those connections, it's actually quite useful. You can work in tandem, but, but yes, you, you're right. Um, ICAC might say, hold off, do nothing, and we want to use our secret powers for a while. Then in, then in, then in which case, you're in a rock and a hard place. Um, now. Let's assume that uh, the uh, nurse has been disciplined, is still in the workforce. Um, and what we're seeing more and more um, is that employees who are disgruntled with what's happened, they're disgruntled that someone has, has dobbed them in, um, they're disgruntled with the decision. Maybe they genuinely want to understand the decision, but maybe also they're looking at getting back at people. Um, they're making GIPA requests, and they're making GIPA requests for the investigation report for the witness statements. I want to know what everyone has said about me. Now, the Government Information Public Access legislation does have a presumption in favour of disclosure. There's an overriding public interest that we should be open about everything and not hide anything, and that there should be uh, openness, transparency and, accountancy, uh, and accountability. But I think they th those aspects have some limitations when it comes to effectively managing workplace relations and managing poor performance and misconduct because what we know is that employees and perhaps as a sign of the Australian culture but we don't dob in a colleague we don't want to uh, put put our head out there on the chopping board so to speak and there's a general reluctance to speak up um, and therefore, as, as employers, what we do, not only as good HR practice, but we do make promises that, look, if you tell us, you know, we, we will keep it confidential. Um, we uh, don't, as HR practitioners, you know, leave an investigation report or someone's witness statements on the coffee table in the common room. It's kept in a secure place, in a file, and only those that need to know all the gritty details get to see it. Otherwise, people get told what they need to be told in the context of a relationship. But GIPA does challenge that. Um, now, there are important considerations that as HR practitioners, as people who, who may be involved in investigating uh, complaints need to be aware of that there are considerations against disclosure if the release of the information could prejudice the supply of confidential information that enables you to exercise your functions, 
So you've got HR functions. You need to be able to um, deal with inappropriate workplace cultures. And if people aren't telling you what's going on, uh, if people aren't supplying you with that intelligence, um, it's going to affect your ability to do that effectively. Um, if the release of, um, for example, an investigation report, the, the release of this investigation report detailing who spoke up against the nurses would uh, prejudice your ability to restore normality in the workplace, to, to break the toxic culture that exists, that exemption's alive, as well as just merely disclosing information that you get in confidence. That's a consideration against disclosure. And it, it's good to say that in most cases, we are getting the tribunal really saying, we're not gonna release the investigation report, we're not gonna release the witness statements. And that's, that's a good position we're in at present. Um, the Noble case involved a culture survey at the University of New South Wales, where they asked within a particular faculty for everyone to give their frank views about management, about their colleagues. And as a result of that, the university learnt a lot about where things weren't going well. And where things weren't going well, those that were the subject of that wanted to see the report. They wanted to see who said what about them. And evidence was given by the person who created the survey saying, the only reason why we get frank feedback in these surveys is because we actually promise confidentiality. And we're not going to be able to manage workplace culture if we can't get those frank views. So if you release this, it sends a message to everyone that don't talk up because it's only going to come back and bite. And to be able to effectively uh, and, and to have a safe faculty, you do need that disclosure. So in that case, the tribunal said, no, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Um, and the same applied in Jones. In Jones, it was a case where the applicant wanted the actual statement from the <coughs> staff member who complained against her. Um, and the department said, look, this is going to impact on the relationships between employees, and it's going to impact on our ability to investigate matters in the future. And the tribunal agreed with that. That they agreed that it would have an impact on the well-being of the staff member who provided the statement. That this staff member would feel anxious, stressed, I um, mean, indeed, de uh, uh, yeah, anxious and stressed about it being released and knowing that they provided that statement. Um, so it really comes back to the, 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 the real key points when you do um, begin this investigation, that you set it up correctly from the beginning. That you're thinking about not just whether we're going to find someone did the wrong thing, but how are we going to work through restoring relations afterwards and how are we going to deal with the worker that's disgruntled and wants an inquiry, a coronial, or an inquest into how everything went. And the way in which you do that is by dealing with confidentiality at the beginning, dealing with confidentiality through the interview process, and dealing with confidentiality at the end. Um, and this is something that we're seeing is becoming much more important uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, work because um, a lot more people are disgruntled these days and they're not accepting what's happening. Um, and the fight goes on and it's rather tiresome. So they're the five areas we wanted to go through at the odds and ends we see um, coming up. We're happy to take questions or see if we can answer anything in particular you might want to ask. James, how does, um, if, if an accusation's made against somebody and they're not entitled to see the details of that accusation, how does that affect uh, the disciplinary or investigative process? So, in, in the process, you'll provide sufficient particulars for them to respond. And, and it may be that, uh, you know, if it's an allegation that one employee uh, said something to the other employee that you need to talk to that employee to say, look, you know, I, I will need to name you. Um, but, but what happens in these investigations is that what you find out is that that bit of behaviour is not the only piece of behaviour that's in play. And other people are talking about, 
look, this is the culture, this is what's happening. And it's about protecting that information. But in terms of the main allegation, that's probably going to be detailed uh, as a matter of procedural fairness with, with, with some um, detail for the person to respond. But, but, but it doesn't mean the worker needs to get everything that person has said about them. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next time.